Hello, my name is David Bishop. Uh, today we're going to be looking at um, ongoing care of a critically ill patient in the district hospitals, in the uh, rural hospital setting. And it's not a situation that you will uh, hopefully be in very often, but you may need to look after these patients sometimes uh, while you're waiting for transfer and sometimes for a few days while you're waiting for patients um, to get better. And I'm going to be talking about a, a system or an approach to this ongoing care rather than the details of each uh, individual component. Now, ICU patients are defined by their complexity. They have multiple problems. They may be at uh, risk of death, um, and the details matter. There have been studies that have looked at um, these critically ill patients that have found that there, there, there may be over a thousand different diagnoses that need to be made in these patients, uh, which may seem overwhelming, especially when you're multitasking in a district hospital. And in these patients that have so little reserve, the details matter. So they, they won't just be able to cope with a lack of clinical care. Every single element counts. And so you can't miss an element that may change outcomes in these patients. Uh, secondly, we know that uh, they, they're normally looked after by intensivists and intensivists know a lot about patients. Um, and it can be intimidating when you walk into an ICU and you hear the discussions that they're having. But the important thing is that some knowledge may be enough to look after most of these patients. You can give reasonable clinical care to an ICU patient without being an intensivist. And even though the intensivists will add a lot of granularity um, and they'll add a lot of knowledge to the situation, um, you can do good care in these patients, even if you're not an intensivist. But I think that systems matter. And even to intensivists, they know that they will forget the details. And so they have mnemonics, they have checklists, they have uh, systems that help them not to miss uh, miss things or have gaps in their clinical care. So even that they have it. And at best, if you're working in a district hospital, you will be an occasional intensivist. You're not going to do this very often. So if the intensivists need checklists or ways of remembering uh, to cater for the whole patient, then the occasional intensivist needs them even more. And that's really what I'm going to talk about now. So when you come to a critically ill patient. There's a number of phases in the uh, management of these patients, and I'm not going to deal with all of them. Uh, often when we get there, we do something ca called a Q-sofa or a quick scan where we're really just looking at altered mental status, respiratory rate, and hemodynamics. Um, and that's a useful way for telling how sick someone is. There are cardiac arrest protocols for patients that have you, you've arrived at a cardiac arrest scenario, and there are all sorts of mnemonics you might use to get through that cardiac arrest. There are stabilization algorithms. And these refer to the first hour and up to maybe six hours in the management of these patients. And again, they, they are a, a systematic way of approaching stabilization of the critically ill patient. And I'm not going to deal with any of these three. I'm going to give you a system for looking at ongoing care of the critically ill patient, the patient that you have now stabilized and you need to reassess maybe a few times a day and on a daily basis. <clears throat> now, I want to just mention to you the concept of checklists, and I'm, I'm sure you've all heard of them with the surgical safety checklist, but the original checklist was uh, developed by a guy called Peter Pronovist, who's um, shown on your screen, and he was tackling the problem of um, central venous catheter um, infection rates. Um, and at the time, he, uh, in his unit, in his ICU, there was an 11% infection rate at 10 days. So one in nine catheters was infected at 10 days. And what he did was he asked the nurses in his ICU to observe the doctors for a month. And in more than a third of patients, they, skip, they skipped at least one important step. Now the steps may seem quite simple to, to us. You just have to wash your hands with soap, clean the skin with chlorhexidine, put sterile drapes on, gown and mask, and when you were finished, you had to put a sterile dressing on. And that that is a really, it seems like a really simple procedure and you'd think that ICU doctors would get it right. But in more than a third of patients, they were skipping at least one step. And then you have to ask, well, what's the impact of that? And so what Pronovis did was he, after this month of observation, he then authorized the nurses to use a checklist to say you must do these five things. And they were authorized to stop doctors if they saw them skipping a step on the checklist. They also got management support, so, so the nurses knew that the administration would back them if they uh, intervened. And then the nurses also had to ask them each day, should any of the lines be removed, so that they weren't left in for longer 
than you think them necessary. And the 10-day line infection rate, rate went from 11% to zero. And so when you get that sort of data in a study, you, you, you have to think, well, is that really right? So then they followed patients uh, having this procedure for more than 15 months. And the line infections in that entire period, there were just two. And they calculated that in that one hospital, that saved uh, 43 infections, eight deaths, and saved $2 million in costs. And then what they did was they rolled it out to the whole of uh, Michigan in a, a group called the Keystone Initiative. And they, um, they rolled out these checklists for 18 months. And in those 18 months, they saved an estimated $175 million in costs and more than 1,500 lives. And this was almost 20 years ago. So it, it would be a lot more money today. And then the, those successes were sustained for over four years while they ran this program. And it was just a checklist. So these checklists have the, the potential to make a massive difference. There's a book called The Checklist Manifesto by a guy called Atal Gawande, he's from Harvard. He's a surgeon, he writes uh, uh, beautifully. The Checklist Manifesto talks about why this checklist worked. And he's also written uh, two other books that are worth reading, one called Complications and then one called Being Mortal, which is just superb. And I'd, I'd recommend reading them. But basically this concept of using a checklist really, really works. We've seen it um, in multiple other settings. Uh, what I want to just stress is that it's, it's not intended to be a paper exercise. So if you're just ticking that you've done it, but you're not really engaging with that thing on the checklist, then it becomes a paper exercise. So you need to make sure that the checklist helps you do things better. It's supposed to change culture. So in those units where they did this for central venous catheters, the nurses were empowered to act and it became that insertion of that line became a team phenomenon where all of them were trying to decrease infection rates. The management actually got involved in procuring the soap they needed. So it really was that culture of this is how we look after this particular procedure. And actually these checklists are supposed to make things easier and better. They they are not supposed to be a thing that you groan at when you do them. So, so one of the things that they do is they help with memory recall, especially with mundane matters that are easily overlooked in patients undergoing maybe a drastic procedure. So did you remember to clean your hands or drape the patient? And in ICU patients, you might forget to get the head of the bed up when the patient's having a fit. So it's, it's important to help you remember the, the, the things that may appear trivial, but are actually very important. And the second effect was to make explicit the fact that these are the minimum standards of care that we need. So they, they establish a higher standard of baseline performance. And I'm, I'm taking these points from Atal Gawande, who writes about these things in the checklist manifesto. And that has evolved into the surgical safety checklist. I'm not going to get into this, but if you're using this uh, checklist in theatre, again, you, you're actually supposed to adapt these things to your context and they're supposed to make things better, not be a form that you get audited on and you just fill it in quickly so that nobody shouts at you. They really are uh, useful tools. Now, there's a tool that was described in ICU by, initially by um, Jean-Louis Vincent, uh, which was called Fast Hugs, and he described that in uh, 2005. He then uh, extended that to something called Fast Hugs Bid, which is on your screen there. I, I'm not expecting you to remember this one in particular, but just to show you that that's the origin of this, and, and that was in 2005 and 2009. And the aim of this was to help uh, ICU doctors ask questions about the things that are on that checklist that are sometimes forgotten. Now, in Peter Maritzburg, we, um, we use a thing called 10 fast hugs. Um, and uh, what I want to stress to you is that while I'm going to take you through this one and propose it as a possibility when you are assessing patients every day, you really can use any mnemonic you like. The important thing is you have one and that everyone in your hospital is ideally using the same one. Now, what this mnemonic does is it helps you when you're assessing the patient each day. It helps you cover all the areas you need to cover and specifically it's a, it's a memory aid that links to management. So when you get to each letter, you think, all right, I'm talking about A is for airway. It then links to what are you going to do or what are your goals of management in that area. It's not a thing where you say HB and you write there HB is five. You should then say, this is what my trigger is. This is what I'm aiming at. And will, will I will 
will I transfuse to get to a certain uh, HB. The nice thing about using one that is in your referral hospital is that when they ask you what you're doing for the patient, you'll be speaking the same language. And why I want to encourage you to do this is that in, in our ICUs, um, the medical officers when they, and the registrars, when they assess the patients, they do this uh, twice a day. In some ICUs, they do it three times a day. But each time they go up to the patient, they literally write these letters down uh, the margin of the page, and they go through it and they make short notes. And they can do this in about five minutes. And it helps them to comprehensively evaluate a, a critically ill patient in a very effective manner. So I'd really encourage you to try this one out. That uh, first part of it, that's the 10. So it's, it's A to J, which is 10 letters. And so that's where the 10 fast hugs come from. The fast hugs is the, uh, the mnemonic below, and the 10 refers to the A to J. Just remember that this is a checklist, not a protocol. So it's, it's, it's a memory aid. It's not telling you exactly what you need to do for each letter. So when it says G for glucose and glycemic control, you will then implement your protocol that aims to keep your sugar within a certain range. If it's 4 to 10, you'll have a, 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 a way that you do that in your hospital. But it's reminding you to get glycemic control and to address it. It should therefore be linked to treatment goals. So I give as an example hemoglobin. If you say the hemoglobin is 10 and everybody's happy with that, you should also think we are going to keep the, the hemoglobin above 7. We are going to transfuse if it drops below 7. And that target of, of 7 that I've thrown out there might be different depending on the patient profile. It might be lower in a chronic renal failure patient. It might be higher in a cardiac. But the point is that you're defining what HB you consider a minimum and how you're going to handle that uh, if it drops below that minimum. So I'm just going to run through this uh, quite quickly because um, each of these topics can be something, um, a whole talk on its own. The A is for airway, um, whether, whether the patient's maintaining their own or whether they require an airway. B is for breathing, and this you would, you would assess the, the lungs, the respiratory rate, the, um, and the, often this is when you go through the ventilatory settings. Um, and once you've assessed how you're doing, that will follow a decision, should we be remaining on the ventilator, can we wean, must we increase the ventilation, the ventilatory support. C is for circulation. Here you would record the blood pressure and the heart rate, but you would also uh, define your target blood pressure. So for instance, if you've selected a mean arterial pressure of 65 that you're targeting, the implication is that when it falls below 65, you're going to uh, introduce measures to get it above 65, whether that is with fluids, uh, or with uh, an inotrope vasopressor uh, like adrenaline. And so it's important that you define these, these minimum requirements for the patient. D refers to oxygen delivery. And here you would assess it looking at your oxygen saturations, but you might also look at other blood tests, things like lactate or base excess to see whether perfusion is adequate. And it's an important part uh, of an assessment where you think, are we delivering oxygen to vital organs, su organs sufficiently? E is for electrolytes. And again, you might need to think, do we need to measure them? And then when you look at the results of those electrolytes, what are your targets? Do we need a potassium above four or a magnesium above one, especially if the patient's in atrial fibrillation? Define the targets and define the actions required to meet those targets. If it's for fluids, so evaluate your fluid strategy. Remember in ICU patients, this is often changing all the time as they become, perhaps they, they are either needing resuscitation or de-resuscitation. Perhaps they're now taking orally and so they don't require the intravenous uh, fluids all the time. And these things should be reassessed constantly because giving too much or too little fluids in an ICU patient can have significant impact on outcomes. GFR it refers to renal and, and really what we're looking at is, is urine outputs and, and making sure that the patient is passing enough urine and that the kidneys are working. Uh, we often review drugs here as well to make sure we're not giving uh, nephrotoxic drugs if those urine outputs are low. The hemoglobin we've talked enough about, but establish a trigger and a response. I ask for infections. So here we look for signs of sepsis and we review the antibiotic charts. Antibiotics often require de-escalation or escalation changes. They need to be stopped. And it's one of those drugs where if you don't look at it regularly and don't look at your scripts regularly, uh, you can forget about them and patients end up having long courses of antibiotics, which can have significant impact on patients. And then J is for in injections or adjuncts. And here we look at um, lines. Uh, do lines need change? Uh, 
changing and, and we, we do urine catheters as part of an adjunct there as well and we're, it's literally a reminder that you should think how long has the drip been in for in, in ICU we change our peripheral lines every three days and our, our central venous catheters we look at a seven to ten day win window usually um, unless there's signs of sepsis earlier but it's a reminder just to check how long have the indwelling things been in for we then move to the the fast hugs part of this algorithm um, and these are just questions you should ask yourself about various aspects of clinical care and I put their context matters because remember that each day the patient uh, the patient's condition may be changing um, and the the measures that you've put in place may impact each level of this fast hugs mnemonic so feeding are we able to feed enterally if the patient's tolerating tolerating enteral feeds are we able to reduce the, the intravenous fluids and um, these are important questions to ask analgesia a very important and often neglected aspect of ICU treatment and remembering that if a patient needed a certain amount of morphine day one post laparotomy they're unlikely to need the same on day three so you need to wean um, increase or decrease as the patient requires it so it's a thing that's worth revising or checking every day sedation is exactly the same especially when you're running infusions uh, in district hospitals people often run morphine midazolam infusions remember that those things stack up patients that are getting better might need more patients that are getting sicker might need less um, and if you've run infusions often they're building up and you may need to actually switch them off and do sedation holds T is for thromboprophylaxis um, remember that patients in ICU need, need thromboprophylaxis unless they're contraindicated and if you've started patients on thromboprophylaxis and they become coagulopathic you need to look at them and see whether you need to stop that head up especially in ventilated patients this makes a massive difference and prevents micro aspiration so 15 to 20 degrees of, of, of head up of the bed also prophylaxis in patients that are not being tolerating um, enteral feeds is very important glucose control we've talked about and and here you're thinking what is the range that I'm aiming for and then the S we think steroid statins and seizure management um, statins are probably not something that is as important in the uh, district hospitals uh, seizure management is obviously important uh, in epileptics and the steroids we give um, hydrocortisone in patients that are on adrenaline so we give them 50 milligrams six hourly once they're on adrenaline um, this has got to do with receptor um, uh, responses to adrenaline so that's really the mnemonic and um, this talks not been able to provide you with details in each area but try out the, the 10 fast hugs mnemonic when you're assessing these patients the first time it feels like a difficult thing to do but as you get used to the the letters it becomes quite a useful tool uh, when you're looking after sick patients remember that once you've done this in each area you can always phone an ICU that you refer to and ask them around these elements um, and you'll have had a much better holistic look at this patient and they'll often provide the details and this allows you to layer your knowledge and develop your knowledge in each area that I've spoken about today. And that's all. Thank you very much.